time. Um, thank you for coming to the 30th virtual 2020 National Ryan White Conference on HIV care and treatment. Um, we are going to be talking about the Criminal Justice Initiative, addressing the continuum of care for people living with HIV and or hepatitis C from reentry to, in to incarceration. My name is Arianne Watson, Assistant Director of Alliance for Positive Change. On the panel will also be Jennifer Lee, CJI Program Manager from ACR Health, and Eugene Epps, Community Linkage Specialist from Alliance for Positive Change as well. So I've already done the introductions. Um, I would like to say thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be at the 2020 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment, and for being an invaluable partner in the New York State Department of Health, HIV AIDS, Criminal Justice Initiatives. We also have many partners, but we will go into that later. The Alliance for Positive Change is a non-for-profit community-based organization that helps New Yorkers affected by HIV and other chronic care illnesses, making lasting positive change towards health, house, housing recovery, and self-sufficiency. Each year we help New Yorkers get tested for HIV and HCV. We help them overcome addiction through our OASIS treatment program on our syringe exchange. We provide training for individuals who are certified care education as well as SERPA, which is Certified Care Recovery Advocates. We provide access to medical care to get their health back on track via our Health Homeless Program and other services. We help individuals escape homelessness, rejoin the workforce, replace isolation with community, and lead their healthier and more self-sufficient lives. Eugene, you can take it away. I'm Eugene Epps, Community Linkage Specialist of formerly incarcerated and I'm HIV positive. Um, I work for the Alliance for Positive Change. Um, as Arian mentioned, it's a non for profit um, community based organization um, in New York um, geared towards low income um, neighborhoods who may be dealing with chronic illnesses. Um, the Alliance for Positive Change. Um, provides case management um, for our CJ uh, clients, as well as pharmacy access services, harm reduction um, services, needle exchange, and uh, programs such as the Positive Flight Workshop, which is a treatment adherence program. The Alliance that has individualized service and full service approach for each client to help support them feel better, live better, and do better. Now we'll continue on with ACR Health. Well, thank you, Arianne, for the introduction. Um, like she said, I am the program manager for our criminal justice initiative at ACR Health. We are based in Syracuse, New York, but we also have offices in Watertown, Canton, and Utica. Uh, a little bit about ACR Health. We're also a nonprofit organization that provides a variety of services to individuals in nine counties in upstate Northern and the Mohawk Valley region of New York. Um, services include our prevention department, which includes outrage, rapid HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis C testing, as well as three site ACE STI testing. We prescribe pre exposure prophylaxis, also known as PrEP, as well as hepatitis C and STI treatment on site at our medical clinic. Um, other services we provide our insurance, our Q Center for LGBTQ youth, Ryan White Case Management, um, health homes, housing, syringe exchange program, Narcan training, um, Bridge Suboxone program, as well as several other programs um, that are listed on the slide. So we, in the Criminal Justice Initiative, work with individuals living with HIV and or hepatitis C in nine New York State Correctional Facilities in Central and Upstate New York. We meet with clients one-on-one -on -one in the correctional faci facility through medical or transitional services to coordinate care for medical, substance treatment, insurance, housing, mental health, 
care management, trans services, the legal services, and really anything else they might need to help make their transition to their community smoother. For clients living with hepatitis C, we're able to work with them if they are treatment naive or if they have begun treatment in the facility and will finish in their community. We also do interventions for individuals living with HIV who are not virally suppressed, newly diagnosed, or have fallen out of care to help them combat barriers and to help get them educated on their diagnosis and keep them medication adherent. We work with other community-based organizations, medical providers, Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, and parole across New York State and often other states as well for out-of-state transfer clients. Other services that we do provide in facilities in addition to our linkage and navigation is peer training, HIV, Hep C, and STI prevention and harm reduction education, and as well as peer groups, as well as anonymous HIV testing in not all nine correctional facilities that we serve. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. So the goal of this training is to provide individuals who are attending with information and skills about the criminal justice initiative. At the end of the training, attendees will be able to recognize how the CJI program works, identify the role in facility CBOs and in community CBOs provide for the continuum of care for people living with HIV and or hepatitis C, ascertain information on challenges and or barriers for clients incarcerated and recently released from incarceration, as well as identify changes and challenges for service delivery due to COVID-19. So first I would like to discuss the New York State prison system. Um, I would be remiss to not forget to forget any of the individuals who help us along the CJI program. Um, I'd like to say thank you, Rick Cook, um, Beth, everybody who works for the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute. Um, they are the people who fund this program, as well as our partners, Alliance for Positive Health, Women's Prison Association, Pathstone, Docs Correctional Facility, STAP, the Osborne Association, ACR Health, HC, HBCS, Community Access Services, Community Health, Action of Staten Island, aka Chassis, Roswell Park, the Alliance for Positive Change, and SUNY Downstate. Um, so let's get into New York State Prison. Uh, so the New York State Prison System is quite vast. We have several hubs, but I'll explain that. The New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, um, it's not only the correctional staff, it is also the individuals who do parole and probation as for the community supervision portion. In response for the care, at, they are in response for the care and confinement, as well as the rehabilitation of approximately 46,000 inmates. These individuals are living in 52 correctional facilities owned and operated by the state of New York as of 2019. Prisons are statewide and New York organizes prisons into hubs. In total, we have nine hubs. Um, each of them are vastly different. And we have four reception areas classified by mental health, health, and security needs. So individuals who have specific needs for substance use treatment also go into certain facilities. Approximately 22,000 inmates are released annually from DOCS facilities who are under supervision by parole throughout seven regional offices. So I wanted to, um, generally, if you were, you know, at the Ryan White Conference, I can maybe point at it, but I'll just use my clicker. Um, so right here, I have the location where the Alliance is. We are in New York City. We supervise the areas of Staten Island, Queens, and Manhattan. Um, and those are the facilities that if an individual is released from incarceration, we make sure that they get the services that they need. And up here in the Watertown Hub and the Oneida Hub is where ACR Health is located and they provide services to clients in those facilities. 
Um, is there anything I'm missing, Jen? You want me to continue? Okay. Um, so next we'll go into the history of this program and why it's so unique. So the criminal justice um, initiative was developed in 1990 in response to the emerging prevention and service needs of HIV positive and at risk detainees, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals. The goal was and continues to be to provide a comprehensive, seamless continuum of quality HIV, STD, and HCD prevention, as well as supportive services to individuals in a correctional setting and incarcerated individuals returning to their homes. Services are designed to reduce HIV, STD, and HIV, HCV transmission and improve the health and well being of individuals in facility and after release. So, the reason why the criminal justice initiative is so unique is because it's a collaboration between three entities from um, community based organizations like myself and Jennifer in the list that I provided earlier, as well as the Department of Corrections and the AIDS Institute, in which we collaborate throughout the process to make sure that individuals who are incarcerated don't miss a single step. And that's the reason why we want to kind of flush it out from other states about what we're doing. So some of the successes that we've had in CJI funders who are actually in facility have provided training to over 5,000 HIV, five, trained over 5,000 HIV, STD, and HCV peer educators. Peer educators will dive into that in a little bit through Jennifer, but they're individuals who are trained and educated at correctional facilities. Um, we've also been able to complete over 2,000 transitional plans for HIV positive and formerly incarcerated reentrants. We have, the initiative has provided anonymous HIV testing at correctional facilities. Upon in entrance into correctional facilities, individuals have an opportunity to get tested, but docs, um, some people may be intimidated and feel that they don't want to go and get tested. So CBOs are in the facilities to make sure that they have the opportunity to test whenever they feel like um, throughout the duration of their stay. Um, we have also conducted over 135,000 anonymous testing since 1998, which is an amazing achievement. So here are some HIV statistics. Um, in 2018, an estimated 773 incarcerated individuals were HIV positive, of which 234 were diagnosed with AIDS. That's about 1.6% of the population that are incarcerated living with HIV and AIDS. Um, this was a significant decline. This was a 0.2% decline from 2016 at which there were 892 HIV infected individuals living inside of the facility and 269 were diagnosed with HIV. The vast majority of HIV positive inmates are known to docs, correctional staff and medical staff, well, docs, medical staff, I should say. Um, among those known to docs, medical staff, by um, virtually all 99% are engaged in care. This is an amazing achievement because individuals who are inside of a correctional facilities sometimes feel that they don't want to disclose or inform individuals about their status, but they, but for the most part, everybody who is HIV positive inside of correctional facilities makes it known to DOC staff and because they have made it known to DOC staff, um, the process for their transition back into the community is really alleviated by organizations like Jennifer's and ones that are in the community and one that are um, community-based organizations are the ones who are in facilities and in the community. We are called CJI providers. Um, we're trained staff. We have taken a, a numerous amounts of trainings to make sure that we care for our clients as well as we can. We take artists, um, anti-retroviral treatment adherence services, motivational interviewing, case management, trauma-informed care, 
HIV confidentiality, as well as several trainings on LGBTQ sensitivity, substance use 101, and et cetera. We want to make sure that we are well informed when taking care of our clients because everybody doesn't come from our same life path, but we want to make sure that everybody is treated with as much dignity as possible. So we are really excited about um, making sure that we are well informed so we can care for our clients as best as we can. So enough of me talking, right? <laughs> oh, this is going to be funny when I have to rewatch it in a few months. Um, so in facility and in facility and in community providers, um, I want to provide a warm welcome and a warm introduction again to Jennifer Lee and Eugene Epps. So hi guys. They're the heartbeat of this program. And um I'll go on to the next slide, Jen, so you can talk about your role in the pro process. Um, if I haven't made it clear thus far, so how CJI works is an individual is incarcerated. I, I use my hands a lot, I'm from New York. Um, <laughs> how individuals, they're in facility, and then once they're inside a facility, then they go and meet with DOC staff because they're known to DOCs for being HIV positive, and then DOC staff refers those individuals to Jennifer Lee, which you'll refer, talk more about, and Jennifer refer, refers individuals to CBOs in community. So that's the continuum of care, but I'm gonna let them delve into this themselves. Great, thank you for the introduction about the Criminal Justice Initiative and kind of how we got started and why it's so important that we're working with the population that we're working with. So all of our clients are incarcerated in state facilities. Um, the Oneida Hub and the Watertown Hub, which ACR Health covers, is one substance abuse facility and eight medium security correctional facilities. For our positive um, and or hepatitis C linkage clients, we generally start working with them about 90 days before their scheduled discharge. Um, they might be in facility for a year before we start working with them. They might be in facility for 30 years before we start working with them. Um, and generally we do start 90 days before discharge, but we do sometimes get referrals a year in advance or even a week in advance, depending on each person's unique situation at the correctional facility. So for forms that we use for referrals um, commonly is the DOH 2557, which is a release for HIV related information. The DOH 5032, which is a release of information for HIV mental health and or substance and alcohol use. Um, and for hepatitis C clients specifically, we will use the DOH 3131 and DOH 3138, which is the continuum of care forms for hepatitis clients who are starting treatment in facility and will be finishing their regimen in their community. So we get the referrals from Department of Corrections and Community Supervision staff um, what we refer to as docs, as Arianne mentioned, uh, medical staff and or counselors. So usually our HIV clients are referred from our senior utilization review nurse, who we refer to as our CERN. Um, John Maserati is our CERN in the two hubs that we serve. So John has access to a list of all the inmates in our hubs that are living with HIV and or AIDS. He will meet with individuals who are expecting a release within that 90 days to discuss ACR health services, if they're interested, and what we are able to offer them with our program. If the client's interested, they will sign a DOH 2557 form, and our CERN will inform us, usually either um, email or phone, to give us a little bit of background on the client, release date, um, parole information, and medication information. From there, he will secure fax or secure email all the necessary paperwork. And it's the same process for hepatitis C clients. The only difference is the referral source and the paperwork. Our um, hepatitis C clients are usually referred by our regional infection control nurse of our hub, who is Deborah Miller. And she informs us when there is an individual starting treatment in the facility who's expected to complete their regimen in the community 
or a client who has not started their, H their hepatitis C medication and will not have the time to start it before their release. So we're sent as much applicable information as possible, including parole and discharge information, a comprehensive medical summary, which confirms chronic and non-chronic non current me medical diagnoses, medication lists, any applicable lab work, vaccina vaccination lists, mental health information, and anything else that might be relevant for their care plan. Although there are two main medical contacts for referrals, we have also gotten several referrals from clients themselves, either through letter in the mail, disclosing their status to their counselor, or disclosing their status to one of our ACR health employed peer educators in the facility. So from there, um, whenever we get the information as linkage specialists at the community-based organization, we can schedule a call out with a client through transitional services or medical to meet with them to discuss a little bit more, a little bit more of what we can offer them and what they can expect through working with us. So if they are still interested, when we meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, they sign our consent forms and we begin the linkage process. So we start by completing a comprehensive risk assessment just to get to know them a little bit, um, a little bit about what their history is and what their priorities and goals are when they're going home. This gives them an opportunity to let us know exactly what they're looking for, any providers they're interested in returning to, or anyone that, who, anyone that they would also like us to speak with to help them in their care plan. So like Ariane said, um, you know, we all come from different walks of life. So our approach is very client centered to ensure that clients are getting their needs met in a way that they're comfortable and when they're ready. We meet with clients at the facility an average of three times throughout the development of their action plan. Um, but we can meet with them more often depending on what they need, um, such as if they're high need for services or if they're in need of other interventions such as ARDIS, which is an intervention that we complete for individuals who are not medication adherent, newly diagnosed, or otherwise not undetectable. So once we get an idea of what they're looking for, providers they'd like to, um, to re-engage with services with, we'll reach out to those providers and other community-based organizations in the county that they're going home to, such as Alliance for Positive Change many of which are Department of Health, AIDS Institute, Criminal Justice Initiative funded um, in every area of the state, but there are also other providers that clients might have a history and a rapport with. So we'll inform them through secure email or phone of the client's situation, a little bit of their goals, and just some general information before we secure email or fax them all the releases and applicable paperwork. Important documents include release forms, comprehensive medical summary, parole information, um, comprehensive risk assessment, and a completed linkage action plan. So a linkage action plan is a compiled list of all the client's appointments, contacts, instructions, anything they might need to, anything they might need when they go home before they're able to reach out to us. This also includes parole information, medication information, and any other referrals or information they might need, such as Medicaid number or ADAP number. ADAP, which is the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, um, which is an emergency HIV AIDS um, insurance. So once all those documents are received and we're able to coordinate those appointments and schedule their plan, we will meet with the client one more time before they're discharged to ensure that they have everything they need, service list, contact information, as well as additional brochures and pamphlets for information and education that they're looking for. We will provide both the community-based organization community linkage specialists, such as Eugene, um, and the client with the document with the linkage action plan. As much as possible, we would also like to have a contact person, usually a partner or a family member for the client. Um, that way we can immediately contact them whenever they go home or if they have any issues before they're able to get their phone set up. So, so 
Throughout the process, we do a lot of coordination with other providers and other community members, not just community-based organizations, but often with family members, caseworkers, parole officers, lawyers, counselors, um, landlords, inpatient facilities, and of course, the clients themselves. So after the clients go home, um, and they have all their information. They start meeting with their community-based organizations to start helping them navigate life back in the community. We do continue to follow up them after they are discharged, even though we are primarily an in-facility provider. For HIV clients, the follow-up can be anywhere between two weeks to six months, depending on their needs and what they might have for us. For hepatitis C clients, a little bit longer because we will stay in touch with them until they receive their SBR lab work confirmation three months after completing their complete hepatitis C regimen. So we will do follow-up with providers, the community-based organizations, clients, paroles, family members. So there's always someone that we can reach out to if we can't reach the client directly as long as we have a release signed for them. We also, use, we also utilize RIO or Healthy Connections uh, which is an electronic medical record um, for lab work, treatment status, as well as follow-up appointments, as well as we always make sure they have their insurance, they're stably housed, and are engaged in medical care and substance or mental health if necessary before we close our clients out. As well as we do all documentation of notes, encounters, um, progress, lab work, treatment outcomes, and follow-up in AIRS, which is the AIDS Institute reporting system, the data entry service that we use um, with the AIDS Institute. All these in calls, and I still, I still talk for that one. Um, so I will go forward. Um, I think everything was amazing, Jen. Um, I'll go to Eugene. And you're on. So what can it be improved to better serve our incarcerated and recently released individuals living with HIV and or hep C in New York State? So I think that more funding should be available for clients on uh, recent release. Um, and also uh, more housing support other than HASA, um, as we rely on um, HASA for uh, clients to be um, stably housed in an SRO, which is a single room occupancy, um, basically, or Bellevue, men's shelter, so which we try to avoid. So I think more housing should be available, as well as uh, clients um, should be provided with e-scripts um, which would ensue that clients have their medication upon um, release and not worry about um, losing their, their paper scripts. Um, also, more pre-release programs um, um, should be met with um, our first uh, icebreakers of meeting the clients, maybe technology, some type of technology, form of technology, where we vis um, visually can see one another and introduce ourselves and have a better grasp of um, what our clients actually are um, looking for and their goals. So another frequently asked question that we get is so our testing services in, in facilities, how it works and how we maintain confidentiality doing anonymous testing. So we usually get our clients who sign up either through um, sign up sheets in dorms but most commonly through the groups that our educators teach so we use the or sure or a quick um, oral swab and we will put them on a call at medical for a very big call out such as um, education um, or you know something very um, very big and then we'll meet them for anonymous tests, they are not required to give us anything, any information. All the forms that they sign is for, signed with a number that we provide them. We'll go over a little bit of pre-test counseling just so they know what to expect, um, what to expect if it is a preliminary positive, 
how the confidentiality and the anonymity is stayed, as well as how to read the test and what kind of questions we'll be asking them, a little bit of their history. We'll run the test, they do the oral swab themselves, we show them how to do it, that way it's at least invasive as possible, and then we run the test, we make sure they see the results, they know how to read them, they understand them. If it's preliminary positive, we'll run through um, the process of medications, partner services, um, and their next steps with the correctional facility. If it's non-reactive, we just you know, do a little bit of education about PrEP, um, transmission, harm reduction prevention. Um, after we do the test, they only have that form with their number on it. They don't take anything with them. We don't document anything but their personal information. Despite having their name on the call out, we don't have that documented in any of our ARIS data entry systems. If the person is positive, then we will refer them to docs. We will, like I said, go through the process with them. We'll send them back um, to make sure that people in the medical waiting room don't see anything suspicious and then docs will call them out and start the process of confirmatory testing as well as we're also able to do the western blot test and send it to wadsworth um, through our agency how do we continue to help criminal justice involve population i would say for me i was working with writers and i have my educational background is in criminal justice so um, really not an option for me. I do it because it's my passion. I feel very similarly. Um, in, in my passion for criminal justice, I've worked with um, people who had just been released into the community. My educational background is also in criminal justice and as well is it's very fulfilling and inspiring to see our clients who might have such, you know, a tough background, they might have negative experiences, um, you know, with authority figures, with incarceration, with docs, as well as a lot of trauma, but despite all their barriers and their internal struggles, they're still able to persist, put their trust in us, and then you know, are able to succeed really on their own will. So we're able to help guide them to where they wanna be, but ultimately they're the ones who succeed. And it's really nice to see that outcome despite all the barriers that they've already had just before even getting out. So it's, um, so it's really just those positive outcomes. Not everyone's gonna have a positive outcome, but for us, it's, you know, it's one of our clients, but for them, it really makes a difference for their entire life. And how do I continue to help um, criminal justice involve population is my lived experience. As I mentioned before, I'm HIV positive. So my lived experience and um, let my light shine through the work that I do um, is encouraging to clients um, to want to do the right thing. That is all the questions that I have for you. Um, virtual 2020 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment. Um, my name is Arian Watson, Associate Director of Alliance for Pay for Positive Change. Um, I would like to thank all of our executive boards and our leaderships at ACR Health and Alliance for Positive Change, as well as Doc Correctional Facilities, um, Doc Correctional Staff, CERNs, Discharge Planning Units, the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute and anybody who helps us as well as our hotline. Um, Jennifer and Eugene, we say thank you as well. Thank you to our thank partners. You. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn about our program. And I hope that you learned a little bit more about the importance about why this population is such an important population to serve. Thank you. Yeah. And I thank you, ACE Institute, the Alliance for Positive Change, um, our um, upper management. And I'd just like to thank this time, um, um, take this time to thank you for the opportunity to serve as a community linkage specialist.
So great. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, like it says at the bottom, success is not linear and success is not defined by the provider. Um, I want to reiterate that it's really important that we understand our clients and speak with our clients. With the CJI program, we really focus on motivational interviewing and talking to the client, not talking down to the client, listening to what they need and what their needs are and addressing those needs so that we can continue, continue on the care and make sure that they get to viral suppression if that's their most important thing or if their most important thing may be um, getting hormones because they are in the midst of transition. So success doesn't always look perfect and with our clients, it's not always perfect, but um, there are success stories and we've been, we've been able to successfully make sure a lot of our clients are getting the services that they need and reach viral suppression or at least get to medical treatment. And if not, they are enrolled in ARDIS, which is antiretroviral treatment adherent services, which is for individuals who are treatment naive um, or not in, engaged in medical care. Um, so along with the successes, I'll go on to the challenges and barriers. Um, so, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so, you know, Jennifer. so um, you know, especially in in this situation that Eugene and I um, were were working with, the main you know barriers kind of encompass both of these things. Um, so clients who are transferred or discharged unexpectedly and go home without any of their appointment dates or contacts. So in our criminal justice initiative, we do have all clients fill out a pre-filled release form with all of our partnering agencies on it. That way, in case a client gets transferred unexpectedly to another facility, we are able to connect them to that agency. And the provider who is able to go in facility is able to pick up where we left off. So no client gets lost despite being transferred to another correctional facility where we ourselves cannot keep in contact with them. So when a client's transferred to another facility, we will reach out to that appropriate CBO. We'll compile the risk assessment, the release forms, lab work, comprehensive medical summary, um, and a linkage action plan if that was started, back that to them. That way they have all the information they need to continue working with that client without having to restart the whole process because it can be a loss for a client to have to explain their situation more than one time. A solution to that really is communication and that's been essential in making sure clients who are discharged last minute receive the care of the community and that has been proven, especially in this case. Communication not just with the other providers or community-based organizations or the Department of Correction staff, but also your clients. Building that rapport to maintain that trust and communication in facility is extremely important. In this client's story, the client and his sister were always calling Wendy to follow up and update her, and I believe that significantly contributed to his success. Otherwise, clients are difficult to keep in contact with since we're not able to provide that information with them if they're discharged last minute, as well as often they don't know how to reach us. They don't have access to all the resources that they need, especially if they're going home to a community that they're not familiar with. The second major barrier is stigma. Stigma surrounding HIV status is still very real in correctional facilities in that environment and a major contributor for clients not seeking HIV care. Clients often don't want other inmates or correctional officers seeing their medications, seeing HIV or pre-exposure prophylaxis literature, or even being seen on a list to be seen by an ACR health staff member or other community-based organizations that are known to provide care for individuals living with HIV. With the client, we just discussed disclosing his status and stigma played a big part in client's case as we have to be very careful arranging infectious disease appointments and meetings at HASA while trying to maintain confidentiality both in facility and out of the facility. We've had clients decline our call outs because people in the facility know what we do and people are afraid that that will out their status. 
ways we try to overcome this is making sure that our call-outs are listed vaguely, such as under transitional services, under education services, just to keep it more um, ambiguous so people don't feel like the Department of Corrections staff knows their status and knows why they're coming to see us. We've also recently started working with individuals who are in treatment for hepatitis C as well, which we haven't had as much um, as many issues with in terms of stigma as the HIV stigma is much more prevalent based on myths and old misconceptions that are still um, that are still believed today. We do a lot of education around stigma as well with our linkage clients and in our peer groups and other groups such as ART, um, which is a regular group for um, anger replacement therapy, ASAP, which is the Alcohol and Substance Abuse Treatment Program, as well as Phase 1, which is people who are new to the correctional facility, and Phase 3, which are people who are preparing their release. Um, and we do talk a lot about stigma. That way we could try and combat some of those, um, some of those misconceptions surrounding HIV treatment and transmission. Um, and, you know, with this education, we're, you know, it's, we're in hopes that people living with HIV and um, or AIDS are open to receiving care and services in the facility and feel a little bit more comfortable opening up to, um, to our staff. So a few challenges that I've experienced working with directly with clients is when a client um, is Medicaid called is inactive, uh, we have to go to the process of taking them to the local benefit office and applying for a replacement card. Um, also, we have to call the back of the client's Medicaid card to actually activate their card upon arrival to New York City. Um, sometimes they arrive to New York City before they call the back of the card to activate uh, their services, so their card won't be active. So the other challenge is when a client is released um, directly with a prescription, a paper prescription, which the prescriptions are obsolete, really. Um, it's hard to fill those scripts. Um, some clients forget that they have the slip in their bag. Uh, they are excited about being out. They might lose the slip, and now that process they will have to go through is um, not lengthy, but they will have to go to the emergency room. Um, and in this case, like dealing with COVID, uh, the, the, it was deterred, uh, the clients were deterred from actually going to the medical um, emergency room. So we had to come up with strategic ways of them receiving their meds without um, risk of being exposed to COVID. Jean, did you want to talk about self-management? Oh, so self-management, our clients that, um, uh, that are successful when they are in control and manage um, their own health, um, it's a better outcome. Speaking about the, success, the two successful clients that um, Jen was just referring to was kind of a, a self-managed guy. We didn't have to chase him down to um attend his medical appointments to be involved in the pharmacy um treatment adherence programs and things of that nature he kind of managed those on his own um so those techniques work well with um clients in reaching their goal most times um these traits um are not taught to the to the clients. They know what they want. They have a clear vision of how they want to get there, and then.
we just assist them with getting there and staying on the right track. That it? Yes. So, um, the other challenges and barriers that we face, um, being that we are three separate entities in a way working together to coordinate services for clients, is closing the referral loop. Um, pretty, it's pretty important that we go and reach back out to whoever referred the client to us, such as Jennifer, or if it was Doc's correctional um, facility through the CERNs to inform them about what happened to the client. Because as we all know, there's lots of reports that have to happen and lots of information that on each partner side that they have to complete about the client. So we make sure that We've um, set up calls with the provider at least one month, um, one month after the client has been released to provide them with those updates. Uh, it's worked really, really well because we had like a regular schedule set um, with all of the providers. And on Wednesdays, we made sure to update them about the client, if the client had made it to their medical appointment, their mental health services, so that when they have to run their reports and inform their staff and team that they can make sure to know if that was a success or that was um, pending or whatever. So it's really important that even in this collaboration that we speak and communicate as much as possible so that everybody's on the same page um, about when we need to close the client out and what needs to happen for them. Um, so along with the challenges and barriers, um, I'll go into one of the very, very things that is pretty unique to this program right now, specifically um, COVID-19. <laughs> um, we're all facing it with it. Uh, we're all dealing with it. And so there are services that we dealt with before um, COVID and things that we have to do now. Um, so overall, as I discussed the goals of the program, we were supposed to learn certain things. Um, but pre-COVID-19 client engagement and services, it was pretty seamless. We would see clients, meet up with clients, have conversations one-on-one -on -one in person. Um, and we were able to do that both on our side and the in-facility side. We were able to communicate with clients and talk to clients. And um, as Jennifer said, as well as Jean, we were providing clients with cell phones. Um, our clients, as we discussed, some of them have had incarceration histories where they've been in facility for 10 to 30 years, some less, some more. And so technology is kind of a tricky thing. Uh, but they were able to latch on to that and figure out how to make phone calls and text messages, um, the basics that they needed to get by at that point. And treatment adherence was very much in person and speaking with a client, um, bringing them to their doctor's appointment, getting their labs, etc. cetera. Um, you can, Eugene or Jennifer, if you have anything that you want to bring up about these topics pre-COVID, and then we'll jump into post current our current situation with COVID. Um, we'll jump into that after. Well, um, so I kind of, I kind of, um, if you can hear me, I kind of tied uh, uh, another successful client into um, moving into uh, uh, post COVID to pre COVID. Um, it tied it into the whole story of how we ended and closed the client successfully. You got me, Erin? Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you have anything about um, the service delivery changes due to um, pre-COVID? Like, how did it work for you? Um, I do just want to acknowledge how um, how useful and how important it was for the community linkage specialist to be able to have that opportunity to be the first point of contact for clients when they go home, oftentimes meeting them at the bus station, meeting them at their shelter, um, because a lot of times, especially for clients who don't have a lot of family members or uh, friends support where they're going home to, 
it's definitely a relief, I think, for them to have someone meet them right away and help guide them to get them on the right track because otherwise they're kind of just going in blind and, you know, not having, not being confident in the place you're at, not having that support can be really difficult off the bat, which creates a lot of other barriers, which makes it difficult for people to stay on track with their appointments. They have to worry about transportation. They have to worry about how are they going to call the providers? How are they going to call insurance? But pre-COVID, when we did have that option, I think that was extremely beneficial and something that really took a lot of weight off the client's shoulders. So I think that's kind of been one of the main, um, the main changes that's been making a difference in, in how easy it is for clients to access care. So, um, service delivery changes due to COVID-19. Um, at the Alliance for Positive Change and many other community-based organizations across New York State, um, we weren't all defined as essential. Um, so because we weren't all defined as essential, several of our sites were actually essential because we have a syringe exchange program and we have a um, housing facility as well as the outpatient treatment. But um, we weren't able to be inside of the facility, so clients weren't able to come in as well as at DOPS correctional facilities, um, the word for community-based organizations and, and individuals who are not actually correctional staff or um, people that are incarcerated, they are considered civilians and civilians weren't, um, or volunteers and they weren't actually in the facilities. So client and service engagement really changed how we operate because uh, the one-on-one, -on -one, the handoff, the direct conversations, the smiles, um, that can't really be translated via email, <laughs> via text message, or via um, snail mail. So it was kind of difficult uh, for everybody. I'm sure many of you are watching this through the virtual Zoom, so <laughs> it's different for us too. Um, but we've been able to really uh, maintain co um, communication with our clients, even in this time. Um, Eugene, I think you can probably speak more about the communication technology and telemed, and then um, Jen, I think you can as well. Okay, it's um, so our clients are connected. They wasn't directly seeing um, providers or providers wasn't directly seeing our clients, which was making it difficult to get medication refills and things of that nature. So clients were able to set up Zoom with their um, case managers, um, permitting that their cell phone permit them and allow them to um, have the adequate minutes on their phone to um, operate these technologies. Um, it's been challenging, but a few of our clients will uh, manage to um, pick up on how to navigate these technologies. Yeah, so um, I could talk a little bit about the changes, especially as an in-facility provider, but how it's kind of changed our process. Um, so due to the code restrictions outside agencies, civilians, volunteers, we were not and still are not able to enter the correctional facilities. Currently, we're working diligently with Department of Corrections medical staff and transitional services counselors for them to meet with clients. Um, and we're utilizing secure email, phone, and faxing to really information, documents, resources, and the completed linkage action plan to clients so they know where they can go and what's still available to them during COVID. We do follow up with clients over the phone after they are discharged to a system with other community needs and referrals. Um, but it is difficult because, of course, we're not able to do those individual interventions. They don't quite have that confidentiality. So if they are not comfortable talking about some of their concerns with substance use, um, with their family, with disclosure, they're not able to ask us those questions and get that, that real one-on-one -on -one support with us 
um, as they are working with their counselor or medical staff who's kind of our, um, our liaison for us. As well, um, you know, if they're coming to our office, we will set them up with a cell phone, a welcome home kit, hygiene products, necessities, and food, which I know many other community-based organizations, including Alliance, offers. But for clients who um, might not be as tech savvy, who might have been incarcerated for a long time, haven't had to use a cell phone for a long time, using Zoom or telehealth can be really difficult for them, and that might be a deterrent for them to not attend their appointments or to not engage in care because it's something that they're not used to and they don't have someone sitting beside them to help them navigate technology, set this up, or tell them what to do, especially for clients who might have um, you know, um, a disability, they might have, um, they might have a delayed development, they might not have great vision, for example. So a lot of smaller things that could be barriers to them for using technology for even just their basic medical appointments. Oh, I completely agree. It's been uh, a little bit challenging for clients to understand how to operate this new um, system, as well as just imagine if you were incarcerated for a significant amount of time, um, and then you come home to going to a situation where you're in quarantine, a lot of our clients feel very isolated, are confused about them having to be home. They're glad that they got early release, from um, incarceration, but it's also very, very challenging because they don't know what's their next step, what's their next plan, and when are they going to see us. Specifically, our clients are very used to seeing us on a regular basis, popping up without an appointment. I um, love them, but <laughs> they, because of that situation there, it's very challenging for them. Um, and, uh, but on those challenging sides, we do have success stories. And I do want um, Eugene and Jennifer to talk about those. Do you want me to go first, Eugene? If you want to, if you want me to take it away, ladies first, though. <laughs> um, so I do have a client that I started working with um, pre-COVID, um, but definitely had a lot of the struggles that we are all facing. So of course, this is a tough time for everyone. Um, you know, everyone's been impacted in some way, shape, or form, and it's it's been a tough few months. But everyone's really been hanging in there, and you know, there's always ways just you know to make things work, especially when you do have that communication, you do have that teamwork support from other agencies um, to really assist um, to really assist with these clients. So a lot of the same services are available, but through telehealth, phone, and some in-person appointments. The many physical offices are closed, physical offices that clients might be familiar with. If they know an address, they are able to get to that office and they find out it's closed, or um, agencies that are operating part-time with limited services. Another issue um, is long wait times for services that have switched to phone-only services such as um, social services, Medicaid, other benefits that clients might have issues with right away coming from incarceration or even trying to get um, a non-driver's ID. So clients, you know, it's, it's difficult for clients who don't have regular access to a phone even to keep contact with counselors, therapists, parole, or in any of their family members. But like I said, keeping that consistent communication and taking prompt action when you know something something is going wrong is really the key to making sure that those needs are met and everyone's on the same page. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about a hepatitis C client that I recently had, who I think really exemplifies a positive attitude despite having so many barriers associated with being discharged um, at the beginning of a pandemic. Um, I received a client referral from our RICN um, at medical about two and a half weeks before the client's discharge, uh, where I met with him in the facility for a total of three times. We completed our comprehensive risk assessment, developed a linkage action plan, worked on goals, different options per, 
for providers, new medication for hepatitis C, all those very um, usual things that we work on. And the client was very interested and receptive to medical and mental health care in the community. The client was discharged on the first day of the COVID lockdown, um, something we didn't particularly expect when we started making this linkage action plan and when we discussed these options in the, in the facility. He didn't have a permanent place to stay since he was pending an out-of-state transfer to live with his partner. The client was living in a shelter in a county where he didn't have you know, friends and family, and he was using the shelter's general phone to keep in contact with me. So right off the bat, when the client got out of the shelter, he called me and told me that he was only discharged with two of the 30 days of his, the remainder of his Hep C regimen. I immediately called our RACN, who figured out what was going on. She said the meds, the meds were supposed to be mailed to his parole officer, but for some reason, they never got sent. After a little bit of coordination, she confirmed that the meds were overnighted the same day, and two days later, I got a call from the client stating that he just picked up his meds from parole and he didn't have any issues, and he was back taking it daily. He attended the initial appointment I scheduled for him for mental health, and for medical care and even had a follow-up appointment a few days later where he met his primary care physician through telehealth and everything went well. I also spoke to his social worker and confirmed that he was attending weekly appointments with his social worker and seeing a therapist regularly and was doing well. I also had issues accessing social services, um, SSI and um, his benefits because he was missing some documentation from docs. It had been almost two weeks since he had been discharged and he was still unable to access his benefits, food stamps, or SNAP. Despite getting through to DSS on the phone after a lengthy wait on a public phone, his counselor at the prison was out of the office due to COVID um, as they were um, rotating shifts, but I was able to coordinate with another counselor who was able to provide documentation needed, sent it to his parole officer, and he was able to access his benefits. I'd also been regularly keeping up with my sister to deliver messages since I, um, not sorry, not sister, partner, to deliver messages since I could not reach out to him directly. He confirmed he could finish, he finished his hepatitis C treatment with no issues, and you can, he continued reporting to parole uh, regularly. Soon after, he found out he was confirmed for um, approval for a transfer out of state to be living with his partner after COVID calms down, which he was extremely excited for and which was a big win for us. I looked into medical, mental health, and substance treatment providers close to his address um, that take his insurance and sent them to his partner. That way they could look into some programs and select a provider or an agency that they wanted to go to um, in case of his release, in case of his transfer. So a little while later, I reached out to his partner and she actually informed him that he had just arrived to her state two days ago and that he would call me back. He was actually at a mental health appointment. And he called me back right away. He said he just finished his first appointment um, at a mental health agency that I recommended, and he should all be set after he sent in a couple pieces of ID. Client was extremely happy to be home. He said he was doing great. He was very happy. And once he gets settled in, he would schedule a medical appointment and continue to check in on me regularly um, just to make sure that he was doing okay. Um, as well as he told me that he would um, be on top of getting his SBR lab work for his hepatitis C whenever um, he was engaging in medical care. So despite being discharged in the very beginning of a pandemic, being homeless throughout the pandemic, not having a phone, having problems with benefits, not getting his medication, he never complained and he always was optimistic and in high spirits when he gave me his weekly call. So right now he is at home to support his partner. He's fully engaged in community care and with parole, and he should be getting the green light on his hepatitis C SVR lab results to confirm that he is cured of the virus next week, which is extremely exciting. And I'm very proud 
um, especially of our clients who, who show such persistence during such a hard time. So, you know, everyone is affected by, by COVID, but to come home um, to an unfamiliar location, to be, you know, in a place that all the offices are closed and still be able to have that positive outcome really shows the determination as well as the importance of that rapport and communication. Thank you for that, Jen. Um, Eugene, can you talk about any success stories during COVID? So I have a success story. I had the pleasure of working with a client uh, who was re released from um, corrections. Um, she's the highlight uh, of the month for re many reasons. First, I would like to start by saying that the client have been, me and the client have been collaboratively working together since her release from incarceration. Uh, the client was introduced to me um, during our meet and greet at the Alliance for Positive Change, um, where I was able to find out more about um, the client by speaking with her and how she envisioned accomplishing her goals. I informed the client that I will be here to support her throughout her accomplishments um, with her goals, and I was clear of how I would be able to support her. I also expressed my style of work and I shared my theory um, to the approaches of how um, my story had led me to um, do this work. As we came into the new year, we continue our check-ins. I was able to capture um, the client's um, past and present story. I realized that the client was um, driven and she has the willingness to prosper, but I also um, she was very transparent and honest with me, which um, I like to see the traits in all my clients, but unfortunately most clients do not. In April of this year, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, at the time, it was a high impact on New Yorkers. So our clients um, continue to engage through phone calls and, um, you know, our agency calling in to check to see how our clients doing, um, if they need food pantry services, just whatever supportive services that we could provide to our clients, we were reaching out for. So this particular client, we stayed in um, contact because like I mentioned before COVID, I was working with her and obtaining um, permanent housing. So um, we was faced with uh, a lot of challenges with um, things being shut down in New York City. As a nation work on strategies um, that they seem to enforce to protect the lives of New Yorkers and our state residents, and focus their lens towards obtaining and sustaining essential services like getting groceries, shopping, um, our options of travel was restricted, and how to attend their medical appointments. I found myself, um, on the other hand, adding my focus to the essential needs like refilling clients' phones and getting benefits and helping my clients apply for housing, although that it was a pandemic. Working on attaining stable housing um, was a services, service that provide limited focus during the pandemic. And the client and myself personally looked at ways of protecting ourselves with structural practice and common CDC prevention practices in place. Within our intellectual and preventive um, um, driven conversations throughout, we were able to openly talk about concerns um, with either contracting COVID-19 during our housing search or concerns with affecting our family members by bringing something back to the people that we um, live with or forced to live with. We spoke on several occasions about our stresses that the pandemic brewed in us with focus on uncontrollable factors like processing of the pa paperwork, which slowed down the timing of getting our lease signed. The client was able to still be motivated in our conversations. Her confidence increased and she was able to acknowledge the support she received. The power of communication and time 
is what the COVID-19 pandemic has taught me with approaching my clients. After my first um, client accomplished her goal, she expressed her deepest gratitude and labeled us her mentor. But then looking into the scope of my client's challenges, I was able to see her accomplishments, which were not limited to, but included her ability to be undetected, undetectable while not taking medication. Based on her asymptomatic long-term medical status, which enabled her to be a candidate for the undetectables program and a successful referral to our agency's pharmacy. She also was not um, mandated by parole for a drug treatment um, program, um, which she never had a substance history, which, is, which wasn't a barrier to her goals. She was able to enroll herself in school at John Jay College. She moved out of her mother's home, but was able to find a place close to her mother and her medical provider, which she stated she wished um, and her SMART goals for. Um, she no longer lived in a single room occupancy in the Bronx. Lastly, she accomplished her goals on obtaining an occupation and she now is a paralegal at a law, law firm in Manhattan. Also the client and I continue to stay in contact. Um, and I mentioned to her how proud I am of her um, during the pandemic, which had its challenging, challenges on us. I will continue to look at this client as an ultimate highlight and its success for the linkage um, um, specialist. Uh, this is a CJI um, client highlight that will go down in history. Proper, proper planning prevents poor performance. Yes, our ultimate highlight. <laughs> um, so along with those success stories, um, I'll briefly bring up like the success stories of the our agencies um, during COVID-19. Um, the Alliance has really been able to make sure that individuals who have food insecurity are provided with not only food pantry, but also with um, food vouchers sent directly to their houses. We also have been able to provide clients with PPE directly to their houses along with the food voucher. Um, and those are some just essential items that we've been doing. We've been doing mobile VIN, HIV, and hepatitis C testing, as well as virtual support groups, which are really essential for individuals who are at home all of the time and they're not during quarantine, they're not able to meet up with their friends, see them at groups, attend um, activities, which is really vital to building a community at your agency and building a community within your clients. Um, we've also been providing clients with trainings, um, doing weekly phone calls with every individual who's on our roster to make sure that they've gotten checked in on, everything's taken care of, they're meeting with their care coordinator, and um, we've even been able to celebrate um, events like virtual pride as well as um, do national HIV testing with our mobile van unit. So although we're in a pandemic, <laughs> um, we have been able to see successes not only with our clients, but also with our agencies. Um, Jen, do you have anything? Yeah, so of course, um, services have changed quite a bit through COVID, but that's really not stopping us from being able to help um, clients in all nine counties that we serve. So. Throughout COVID, we were sending at-home testing kits um, for rapid HIV tests for clients when we were unable to um, do in-office testing. Now we have reopened our testing by appointment and we are continuing to send at-home test kits to make sure that clients still have access to the service, even if they are not able to or not comfortable coming into the office for testing. But we have opened up our full testing range, which includes 
rapid HIV, rapid hepatitis B, rapid syphilis, as well as our three site testing, which is the pharyngeal swab, the rectal swab, as well as urine samples. So we're able to catch um, chlamydia and gonorrhea from all different points, whether it's through vaginal sex, anal sex, or oral sex. Uh, we've actually had quite a few positives since we've started opening up our in-office testing again, which means that we are reaching um, a population that is really in need of our service, and we do provide um, on-site um, chlamydia and gonorrhea treatment, as well as hepatitis C treatment for all the positives that we do get. Throughout COVID and currently, we are also doing weekly Narcan trainings and Narcan kit pickup for anyone who um, might need a replenished set or might want to have more on hand. We also are currently doing our diaper and pantry drive, which we are delivering to clients' homes. So this is a service that we do regularly offer, but we've had an increased demand based on, um, you know, inability of, um, you know, any, your clients were unable to get out and do their groceries or people who might have had a lack of funds. As well as we are continuing all services for our existing clients, including care management and new services. Um, but we are always and have been throughout COVID been accepting new clients for hepatitis C treatment, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis prescriptions, and uh, our Suboxone Bridge Clinic, so medicated assistant treatment. As well, our syringe exchange program has always been running at, both, at all of our sites in Utica, Watertown, and Syracuse, as well as providing sharp spins since a lot of places, public places that would have sharp spins are unavailable. So we are providing sharp spins to our clients and exchanging them for new clean ones whenever they get full. Um, and one of the more, um, and one very important essential part is also our insurance program as we've enrolled thousands of clients for insurance due to the lack of um, jobs that were lost, furloughs and layoffs that happened during COVID. So that is definitely a high need service that our clients uh, and people in our community um, are definitely in need of. Sorry, I wouldn't go off of here. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Jen. And um, due to the fact that we are now where we are, um, I figured let me go into some frequently asked questions. Uh, we kind of worked together for a really long time and people ask questions about our program and they have some things that um, they're confused about or they have more questions on. So I figured we would just include this in this section. Um, and then when we're in the actual conference, this will help alleviate some things that people might have queries on. So, um, what can be improved to better serve the incarcerated and recently released individuals living with HIV and or HCV in New York State? This is to both of you, Jen and um, Eugene. So um, I can start. Um, I think really just more education and awareness about the services that we offer. Uh, a lot of people aren't really aware of the services we offer because we, um, in our side of the in-facility um, portion, we reach people who are incarcerated and we don't directly reach the community. So people often forget that this service is available, but uh, making sure that people know so that way their friends know their colleagues know that way if somebody they do know is incarcerated that these services are available to them um, and making sure that you know people who do um, who are living with HIV and or hepatitis C in the facility are aware of our programs and that stigma um, you know is not stopping them from getting the services so I think the criminal justice initiative does a really great job structuring the program in how we deliver those services. It's really just about getting the word out there that these are available. So our services are here. They just need to know that they can access us. Yeah, 
So I think that some things that could be approved that help us better serve our clients would be one more funding um, so that we could have um, more options um, for clients needs, uh, such as housing support. Uh, we have to rely on um, HASA um, for our clients to be stably housed in uh, SRO. So I think that um, uh, more housing options can be proved. Also, um, uh, e-strip for clients' medication. I think that we just rely solely on their um, script to be physically with them. And I think that it would be um, a little bit more stable if their medications were already e-script to a pharmacy um, out in the community um, so that it could be one less um, worry about getting the client's medication and then they could focus on connecting to medical care. Um, also, I think that um, pre-release could be improved maybe some way linking um, the community linkage specialist, maybe through some type of virtual um, tool um, that's supported with docs. And we could get a jump on the icebreaker before we even meet the clients out here in the community. Question, is testing in prison, how does it work? And um, how do you maintain confidentiality? So I can answer that portion. Um, we do the anonymous HIV rapid test, the aura quick or um, the oral swab in the correctional facilities, and that makes it the least, um, and you know, that makes it the least invasive, the least material to have to be brought in. So. Clients can sign up either um, through a mail-in slip from our brochures, or they can request it through our peer educators, through groups, or their counselors, or even medical. They get put on a call out just for general medical education. They don't say that they are there for testing. Um, once we get in there, it's completely anonymous. They're assigned a number. They can sign some consent forms. Uh, for our services, signing with their number. Um, they don't have to provide any personal information, um, just a small demographic form, including their date of birth um, and ethnicity demographics. What we do, we will just kind of run through um, some pre-test um, counseling to make sure they're ready, they know what to expect, they know how the test is run how um, to read the results and to make sure that they are ready to be tested and they are safe um, to be tested in case there is a preliminary positive. We will run through the test with them. We will provide them with the results after um, 20 minutes is passed. And then we are able to do a little bit of post um, testing counseling as well, just to answer any questions they have about um, transmission, harm reduction, symptoms, anything like that. So in the event that a person does have a preliminary positive test, we will do the post-test counseling, make sure they know what to expect in terms of um, the confirmatory testing, treatment, partner services, but they will be sent back and then they will be reached out to immediately through Docs Medical to make sure that we can get that confirmation test and we are also able to do the Western Blot test. Um, if necessary, to send out to our Wadsworth lab. Um, they can switch to confidential testing if they would like a copy of their results, but the test is completely anonymous. And then once they leave, we document it anonymously in our um, AIDS Institute reporting system, and we never have documentation of who came in for testing, despite having their name down on the call out. We do not keep that record. Um, I think we have a little bit of time left, so we'll just go through these questions a little bit fast. But um, what programs can clients complete in New York State prison and in the community? 
So really quickly, I know we did mention several times our peer program. That is a program that clients can sign up through mail-in letters, sign up sheets in dorms, active peers for advocating and recruit for our programs or even linkage clients. Um, we teach a week-long course. Um, it's a curriculum made by the Department of Health AIDS Institute, including modules on HIV, STIs, hepatitis, transmission, prevention, harm reduction, stigma, et cetera. Once they complete the course, we can meet with them one-on-one -on -one to discuss going forward, such as goals as being a peer if they're interested and deemed eligible. They are able to co-facilitate groups with our educators, and then eventually they're able to teach groups independently on the material that they're learning about harm reduction and HIV. Um, we do observations, um, information updates, and evaluations regularly to make sure that they are still on top of you know, the material and that they're doing well, they're not having any issues, as well as they can be eligible for parole letters if they do stay engaged and stay um, with our program, as well as the information, the certificates, and the, um, and the letters that they receive can be used for eligibility for the New York State AIDS Institute peer certification through Stony Brook University. That way they are able to use um, and learn some valuable work experience and skills and training in a field that they're passionate about with lived experience that they can relate to clients with. In the community, um, at the Alliance for Positive Change, we have a peer program. It's separate from the peer program that's in facility, but we offer it to individuals who are interested. As we also discussed, there's a Certified Peer Recovery Advocate Program. We also have training specific to individuals who inject. We have support groups. So clients have a wealth of knowledge and trainings that are available to them during and after incarceration. It's more about them taking the, the leap of faith to attend and um, us helping them along the way and after. Um, so the next thing is what methods do you use to retain clients? I believe on the Alliance's side, I use Eugene to, to really engage individuals at, the, at offices and talk to them and make sure they're informed. Um, Jen, is there anything special that you do? We also do welcome home backpacks and cell phones that have hygiene kits and a plethora of other things inside of them. I would be remiss to not mention our transitional guide. Oh. <laughs> The department, Showed it. Uh, the department of Health really <laughs> loves that guy, so I would I'd be mistaken to not mention how important that is. Um, but Jennifer, you can take it away. Um, so retention, um, really having um, those clients access the um, HIV um, prison hotline that is offered through the Department of Health as well making sure that the clients do have access to someone to call if they cannot access us directly, um, as well as I think the main thing being that client-centered approach that we've talked about several times, being involved in the Department of Corrections. A lot of the times they're used to being told what to do, and we're making sure that we're focusing on their goals realistically, and they know that we're on their side. Um, a lot of times counselors and linkage staff think they know what's best for the client, and it can be difficult for us to not try and enforce um, our opinions on what we think will help them succeed, but really focus on their needs. And I think building that trust, building that rapport is really important in getting, um, in, in keeping that retention. Um, in addition to obviously the incentives such as hygiene care packages, prepaid phones, um, and assisting with transportation, really just having them see that we are, you know, really trying to help them access all the resources possible, and we really do want to see them succeed. Have any notes about how you retain clients? How do we retain clients? Um, it, I guess it was mentioned earlier. Um, our key way to um, have retention is uh provided making sure that we provide um the clients with cell phones and minutes for their cell phones every month um it's been useful it's been a, a helpful way of retention as well as um 
providing clients with incentives for um, uh, providing their lab work on time and um, uh, undetectables and uh, program interventions, they will provide um, incentives for as well. Um, in terms of the question of how long do we work with clients, we usually work with our clients for six months. Um, through the in community side, um, oftentimes uh, we try and work with them for six months, but sometimes it will be a little bit longer because an individual may have a relapse, may get reincarcerated, or um, COVID-19 happens in which we feel like we need to stay with them to make sure that they transition. Um, fully before we let them go, but overall it's six months on our side and for you, Jennifer. Um, I already discussed it a little bit earlier talking about um, our clients, but for HIV clients, really as soon as they had that warm handoff with the other community-based organization and we can confirm they're engaged in medical care and for hepatitis C clients, we will keep them until they reach their SVR and we are also sure that they are continuing to engage in care and don't need any further assistance. So once they are um, self-sufficient or handed off to another program, that's where we um, end our services. Um, and then the final question, how do we continue to help criminal justice involve populations? Um, on my side, it's a passion. I've worked at Rikers, I've worked at uh, a reentry is my passion. So how do I continue is more of a, I don't think I have any other choice <laughs> in, what I, in what I enjoy. So um, I love to see them change, challenge themselves, improve. So that's why I continue, and um, that's me. Uh, but you, Jennifer, and Eugene, you can go. Um, so um, how do so we for me, Go ahead, Jen. Um, so for me, it's really seeing those positive outcomes, especially for clients who do have very difficult backstories, they have difficult situations, and they have had a lot of negative experiences either in their families, with other providers, with Department of Corrections, seeing them really put their trust in you and then really it coming together and then having a positive outcome and the gratefulness that they have um, for, for your help really makes a big difference. Not every client will succeed the first time, not every client will succeed the second time, but whenever they're ready, whenever they finally see that positive outcome, it's completely worth all the, um, all the, you know, the hoops they've had to jump through and the things you've had to help them with because for us, it's one client, but for them, it's their entire lives. And that's really, um, it's really inspiring to see people with such a difficult, um, such a difficult history and confide in you to, to be successful in the community. 